morning in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. This year's edition is especially important because this is going to be the last one before the European elections in 2024. And special occasion, of course, it requires special guests and we are very happy to have here our president of the parliament, uh, Madame Roberta Metzola. So thank happy you. Happy to be here. Thanks thank for you very much me. for joining us Absolutely. and uh, really thank you that you agreed to answer these questions that we are receiving on our social media channels from of course. the people. Uh, so first of all, a uh, State of the Union debate, uh, why is it going to be so important uh, this year and uh, what can we expect? Well, first of all, uh, in our annual calendar, this is one of those events, uh, addresses before the plenary uh, in Strasbourg, where uh, the Commission President, uh, together with the Commission, presents um, uh, her vision uh, for uh, the next year. As you said, uh, this year, as the last one of this legislature, coming uh, at the heel of a very difficult few years, uh, first with a very um, a devastating pandemic, uh, and now uh, with the illegal, brutal uh, invasion by Russia of Ukraine. Uh, it is one where we look forward to a difficult, challenging period ahead in terms of legislative challenges, but one where I expect and this parliament expects to look forward with a plan to reform and reboot Europe. That is what our citizens want. Difficult decisions require sometimes difficult to get solutions, but ones with vision and courage. And what do you think that really our citizens would like uh, to hear from you, from you right now? And uh, uh, what is still you think is realistically for the parliament uh, such to achieve uh, before the elections last, next year? Well, in every election such as this, one that takes place every five years, unique in the world, 27 countries voting at the same time for the same parliament. Messages are always similar. This time will be, I think, even, let's say, tougher on the representatives. First of all, decisions need to be human-centric. We need to make sure that we retain our climate ambitions at the top level. We need to create a safety net for our businesses, our small businesses, our industries. We need to make sure that what we say here, at the moment we are sitting together in Brussels, uh, resonates in each and every village and town of the European Union. That is what Europe is all about. It is not only about making laws, but it's about taking decisions that will make people's lives better. How do we make people's lives better? By addressing their concerns, by listening to them. Their concerns are about migration, about the state of their uh, personal or even nation economies, about rising inflation, about climate, about um, the increase in temperatures, forest fires, as we have seen, you know, unprecedented number in Europe uh, uh, and also in terms of environmental uh, catastrophes this year. This is what people want to see from Europe. And I think that if we focus on these issues and talk to people, this is my job, my colleagues' job, all candidates' job, I think we can come back next year with a parliament that is ready to go with a reformed uh, and rebooted Europe, really. And talking about all these issues and reforms, what, is, in your opinion, are the biggest successes of the parliament or from last year? Well, I, I, I think, first of all, the unity that we have found in response to the war. Uh, this parliament, already on the 2nd of March 2022, a few days after the Russian invasion, the parliament stood up almost unanimously and said Ukraine and Moldova should be candidate countries of the European Union. The, since then, very efficiently taken decisions on gas storage, on ammunition production, but also the big climate packages when we talk about emission trading scheme carbon border adjustment mechanism, the social climate fund, to digital, digital markets, markets act and digital services act that have just come uh, into force. Looking forward, uh, media freedom, anti-slap, we look at AI we are working on, we've worked on an unprecedented leader in chips, for example, in the criminal law area, migration still a lot to do, but at the end of the day, this parliament has shown that when it comes to taking decisions, it can do so efficiently, promptly, and also always taking in mind and keeping in mind that what the citizens want are at the very heart of the decisions that we are taking. 
Well, and according to the latest Eurobarometer report, the interest in the European elections is uh, really growing with half, uh, almost half people saying they're interested and two thirds are saying they will vote. Uh, what do you think is the reason behind this increase in the interest in the European well, elections? First of all, I will hope and I will work towards uh, an increase in that interest. Uh, I uh, must say that it, it is due also to the fact that even during the pandemic, this parliament was at the forefront of, 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 of pushing through the largest ever financial package that would help economies uh, recover. Uh, and are still being used to help economies recover in each of our towns and villages. Secondly, I, I would say that it is us talking more and listening at the same time. Uh, I make it my mission to travel to all um, countries, individual countries, including my own Malta, of course, uh, and I speak to students, I speak to, um, uh, uh, to representatives of different industries, I speak to climate activists, I speak to, 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 to the businesses and the industries, I speak to you know, young people at the end of the day, even who were like me at the time uh, in politics, looking at Europe as one where your quality of life could increase, your protection could increase. Still a lot to do. Not everything is perfect. Uh, we still have way too many people who feel left alone after the pandemic. Still have a big challenge of mental health. We don't um, uh, protect our marginalized societies, our minorities, our communities, uh, LGBTI community uh, uh, enough. Uh, we also need to do much more in those areas of the European Union that are economically struggling today. Yeah. Uh, and those people are EU citizens and they are looking to us. So their interest must be driven by the fact of who can address my immediate day-to-day -day problem. Can I continue to afford to live in my house? Is my government, is Europe going to help me? Will my children make it through school to find a job? These are all questions that can be answered by decisions that we take here in the Parliament. And that interest must stem from there. Well, you mentioned Ukraine before, and of course the EU has been supporting Ukraine since the beginning of the war. Uh, what do you think about the EU response? What do you think uh, about the EU support to Ukraine? And what sh overall should be the EU's global role? What well, first of all, that response has been unprecedented. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the very uh, quick decision by this parliament uh, to uh, grant candidate status uh, to Ukraine uh, and Moldova, but which was then followed by unanimous decision in the European Council. Uh, that was not by chance. It was thanks to Ukrainians uh, who every day are fighting for our values, for our freedoms, for peace, security and stability in Europe. And our response can only be to double down every day in order to make sure that we stand by, side by side with Ukraine. Uh, we've done a lot not only in terms of political decisions, but in making it easier in terms of the pre-accession process, you know, as we <laughs> gear for a very, uh, um, uh, let's say, pivotal autumn where decisions will be taken on the next steps uh, for uh, accession for the parliament. Accession negotiations should start already uh, this year uh, if all the steps are completed. Also in terms of financial assistance, reconstruction, military and logistical help. There we can do much, much more. And finally, on sanctions. Uh, this parliament has always pushed to make sure that the already unprecedented uh, packages of sanctions that have been adopted are not only adopted but also implemented by everybody, every country uh, that is an ally of the European Union that would like to come closer to the European Union needs to fully abide by those sanctions. And we can always go further. We can always find loopholes. We can always make sure that we plug the gaps in order to ensure that this um, uh, crimes that are taking place every day, people, a people, a country that is being targeted, bombed every day, that this ends and that we can say that we have peace on our continent once again. Well, you also mentioned the candidate status of Ukraine and uh, very often we receive messages from people who live in the other candidate states uh, asking about their European path, like Balkan states. Uh, when they can expect uh, to become members and in the meantime, how can they benefit from the EU program? Programs. Well, the European wow. Parliament has mm. been, you know, the strongest ally if we look at Ukraine and Moldova and, and Georgia, Western Balkans, 
uh, we have always said, that, and, and, and this is not something that we just say, but we really believe in it, is that a larger European Union uh, is a more secure, more stable, more free continent. Uh, and I can say this from personal experience, uh, where I went through or lived in a country that saw the transformative effect of being an applicant country to a candidate country to a pre-accession country and then a member state. It's, we're soon coming on 20 years of membership next year. The, these countries, my country together with nine others and then later with Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia, the changes that they have seen have been enormous. The rise in standard of living, in quality of life, in access to opportunity, opportunity in rules, better rules for protection is nothing that would have been possible also in terms of financial stability without the European Union. So my message to all those countries is that yes, each country has its own path, but you will find in this house your friends that will always think of a larger European Union as a stronger and more stable one. And climate change. Uh, climate change is of course a very important topic. 77% uh, of people think this is the most pressing issue right now. So how is Parliament fighting the climate change? And, uh, what well, we have it? been the biggest proponents mm -hmm. of having the most ambitious uh, climate legislation on the planet, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, you even have other continents looking at what we are doing, how we are managing to uh, uh, keep that balance between being climate ambitious and making sure uh, that our populations are still with us when we put forward such ambitious uh, legislation. If you think about what we have done, for example, in the Social Climate Fund, where we made sure that our small businesses continue to be protected, even when regulation would impose additional costs. When we look uh, at uh, certain um, uh, legislative, uh, legislative instruments that are necessary, but might need, for example, a little bit more time for enforcement in member states. But at the end of the day, and I respond here to the, those 77 percent, and this especially after a summer where we saw the effects of climate change everywhere. I don't think there was one country that could escape those effects in terms of either visibility, but living in them. We talked about forest fires, we talk about flooding, um, flash floods also, mudslides. These are all um, climate phenomena that never used to take place so rapidly or so often. Uh, in the past, this is a, a, a reaction of a changing climate. And what are we doing about it? This House not only legislates, but spreads the message and goes to different parts of the European Union to say how important it is to take those sometimes very difficult decisions. Yes, they need to be cushioned. Yes, they need to be explained. But at the same time, necessary. Because we only have one climate, one planet. And we are the last generation of politicians that have the possibility to do something about it and we cannot lose that opportunity. Uh, well, migration is and migration is another very important topic. It keeps being on the headlines. Uh, we keep hearing either we discuss about the integration or we keep hearing about uh, ships that are they are sinking in the Mediterranean or let be the English Channel. Uh, what do you think about the EU's uh, migration policy? Can it improve somehow? Mm. We are coming to 10 years of what the audience will remember as a Lampedusa tragedy, mm. when the Mediterranean Sea was called by Pope Francis as the largest cemetery in the world. What have we done since then? That is a question we need to ask all of ourselves. When is our migration policy going to become one that is truly fair with those who are eligible for protection, that is firm with those who are not with a very coherent returns policy, and that is harsh with those who seek to prey on the most vulnerable people on the planet, smugglers, traffickers. We have on the table a pact, a package that ticks all these boxes. It is up to us now to put the legislation on place. We are moving in the Parliament. We have moved quite uh, uh, rapidly on this because we have understood the last election in 2019. Migration was the topmost concern uh, of many of our populations. We need to be able to say in 2024 that we delivered on those concerns. Now, is everything perfect? Absolutely not. Will we manage to resolve all our issues and 
treat all countries the same? Of course not. Different countries have different realities, whether you're a frontline state, whether you, are, you have a sea border, a land border, uh, whether you get second removements, in other words, people entering irregularly in your territory and then moving country. These are all um, uh, geographic or national situations that are being tackled on a national level. But in our case, we have legislation that can streamline procedures, that can create a, a nest of protection. If you ask me, I would like to go further. I would like a system where you can apply for protection from outside the European Union in order to prevent from the almost certain death once you try to cross a sea. Uh, we are not there yet, uh, but with strengthened external border policies, with a solidarity mechanism at its core, I think we can find that right balance. We also receive many questions and people are noting that the cost of living in Europe is really growing and salaries not always keep up with this. Uh, so how can we make sure uh, to keep the Europe's economy growing but at, and at the same time remaining competitive or being competitive? This is mm. something that needs to be done also at a European level. Uh, we need to give member states what one would call flexibility uh, even if not within the legislative and regulatory framework, but also when we're discussing country by country in terms of use of cohesion funds, uh, regulatory um, rollout of what is needed at a national level. We need to cushion the social and economic impact. We are still feeling the social and economic impact of migration. We are still feeling the social and economic impact of um, the pandemic. And we are feeling, uh, are not making the, the link between where we need to plug the labour market gaps and persons who come to Europe because they need a future. They come to Europe for hope. Uh, and when our citizens tell us, and they are right in telling us, the burden is too much, we feel like we are being strangled, we feel like we have a brain drain, our young people are leaving, they have no future in their country, we get this from countries in the European Union. We get this from countries that are neighboring the European Union as, as well. We also tell, get businesses telling us I have no option but to move my, my production line outside of Europe. I want to have a Europe that remains a home for everyone, remaining competitive while cushioning those social and economic impacts that are hurting our individuals, our elderly generation, our women in, uh, 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 in the European Union that uh, are still far away from having the level of equality that we need that we with men in our union. Uh, one last question to you today. Uh, free and open media is crucial for democracy. And what is Parliament, I mean, we have many journalists that uh, making sure that those people, you know, who are in power, that they are put on the account. And um, how, what is Parliament doing to make sure that um, journalists are protected and that we still have a free media? This has been a priority, uh, and you can see with the pictures uh, mm. in, behind us, uh, mostly since 2017, when uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia was uh, assassinated uh, in, in Malta, and a few months later, Jan Kuciak uh, was assassinated in Slovakia together with his fiancée, Martina Kuznirova. Uh, there, the European Parliament stood up and said, we cannot have a union where protection is given in many different areas, where an analysis of is done for member states in their economic field and their justice field, but not in their media freedom protection of journalists field. And we found a loophole and we filled it. The European Parliament uh, adopted an unprecedented uh, um, anti-slap, which is a strategic oh. lawsuit against public participation, which are lawsuits that are used against journalists um, essentially to, to, to scare them uh, from, uh, from holding people accountable, from searching for the truth. Uh, and uh, we now have a law on the table that is being negotiated in, with the Council. If we had not started that in the Parliament, I don't think that would be on the table today. We're also going to vote in the next days on the Media Freedom Act. Uh, this is an unprecedented piece of legislation that seeks to create, as far as possible, a common field still very far away. I would like us to be more ambitious. I would like us to, um, uh, to be able to find a good... Uh, middle ground um, uh, where all member states can implement such a, such a, a, a law because it will impact different member states uh, in a different way because of different systems that exist. But for me, it is clear. The European Parliament is at the forefront of the protection of journalists, has always been and will always be. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, all the time we have today. You already took uh, lots. Of, we took lots of your time. So thank you again for your thank answers. You. That is clearly lots that has been done and still needs to be done. And we look forward for our next, next conversation with you. And in the meantime, I also invite everybody to follow the State of the Union debate uh, next week, which will happen in the European Parliament on Wednesday at 9 a.m. You can find more information on our social media channels and at europarl.europa.eu website as well. So thank you again. Thank you. And have a nice day. Mm -hmm.